questions will be clinical. Um, hypertension, big problem in the United States, everywhere. You'll need to know everything there is to know about it clinically, and Dr. Tenner is the man. All right, MIs, histologically for pathology, they might ask you a question, as I just did, about the gross or microscopic dating, early or late. That's about really what they'll do for MIs. But histologically, do, about the, the kinds of uh, laboratory tests you need to know about. If you're taking part one, they will have the things inside the booklets or available actually online to you now because they, you do them online. Um, and they give you the normal values of them. But certainly, uh, you don't want to have to go and check every single normal value of hematocrit every single time. So you need to be familiar with the laboratory tests in any given area that are the most important. Um, and you'll learn them slowly but surely over time. Um, I've listed them at the end of this talk that we'll probably never get to. Uh, but again, um, by the end of, gosh, the second year, you'll be familiar with most of them. Certainly troponins and CKMB are very important in, the, in, in their evaluation here. And troponins have pretty much taken over for any of the others in the United States because it's not only up early, but also stays later than CKMBs. And that's a classic question. EKG changes, depending on what board you're taking, you'll need to need know more about those. It's really the basic arrhythmias you need to know about. Okay. So here we have a, there are some things that can be asked about because they have classical clinical scenarios. And this is one, uh, a 35-year-old man presents with syncope, found to have a diastolic heart dysfunction with thickened left ventricular myocardium. An important here is the age. He's only 35. Really important. Clinical scenarios, very important. All right? An endocardial biopsy of the septum shows myocardial fiber hypertrophy and disarray. The underlying defect in this disease is A, a gene mutation causing accumulations of transthyretin. B, an autosomal dominant mutation in gene encoding fibrillin 1. C, an X-linked mutation linked to dystrophin gene. Or an autosomal dominant mutation in the sarcomere gene, B, D. Okay? Everybody got that? So you, from that information, you should know what each one of those four diseases are and see if it matches up with the clinical history. So let's give it a chance. Go ahead. Oh, <laughs> okay, so wh why don't we leave this up the way it is. This is good. All right, so we have the choices between B and C right in the level, but who's right, okay? What is A, gene mutation causing accumulation of transthyretin? Or prealbumin, some people call it. Ah, oh, you don't know that one. Okay, we'll get to that. All right, B, autosomal dominant mutation in the gene encoding fibrillin 1. So why did you pick? <laughs> <laughs> it was a guess, right? <laughs> Okay, so let me, you, so 46% of you are just equally good guessers, right? Okay, and then some people risked out here. Okay, let's see, let's see how, what do I have. Now, if the choices were A, can we go, can we, we, can we go back differently on this one? Go back one? You can't, okay. A, the abnormal accumulation of a bad product of transthyretin is amyloidosis, all right? That's not the clinical history I gave you. That's something that can occur in the heart. But, and, and it can have a, it, it can specifically, it can have a, uh, a restrictive or uh, uh, diastolic dysfunction problem, all right? But it is not, it does not have the hypertrophy and disarray. It has amyloid, that sort of wax-like pink stuff, okay? So it doesn't have the right microscopic description. 
hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, all right? Which one is that? Which one of those? This, these are out of order. This is a different order, actually. Which, what is its, can we take both of them back? We have, okay, see, so in Marfan syndrome and muscular dystrophy, can we go back? Both, both of them back to the uh, previous ones? Oh, no. Okay, no. <laughs> Can we go back two slides? Oh, well, we have some people. Okay. <laughs> Only four. That's right. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. That, go, go back. Go back two. Two slides. Back two. Backwards. Oh, back. I can do that. If I can do that. Okay. <laughs> Duh. All right. There I go. Look at that. I have control. <laughs> no, I, I thought after they did that, never mind. Okay. Now, actually, this is going backwards here. Right here. Come on. <laughs> Hold on. All right. It's time to go home, guys. See, this is not going backwards. <laughs> I've screwed it up. There, that, okay, there, okay. Gene mutation, accumulation of transthyretin, okay. I'm, I'm getting challenged as the day goes on, sorry. Is amyloid. Autosomal dominant mutation in fibrillin 1 is Marfan syndrome, all right. X-linked mutation, dystrophin, muscular dystrophy. All right, and autosomal dominant mutation in the sarcomere gene, sarcomere gene is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is what the answer was, okay? <laughs> so, so D got it right, <laughs> all right, <laughs> all right. And uh, C-linked is dystrophin, which can muscular dystrophy, those people do die of cardiomyopathies, but they die of dilated cardiomyopathies, all right? And also, people with Marfan syndrome have trouble with what? Aortic dissections, okay? So all of those were very reasonable things. You need to know the histology, all right, as well as the classical uh, differences between dilated cardiomyopathies, hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, and that's the big one because that's young persons, Genetics, that's the one we've been talking about. And then restrictive are very much like hypertrophic. They produce thick ventricles that don't take in a lot of blood and have problems with backup, all right? And so that can be uh, also amyloidosis. So they're all very reasonable answers. You just needed to know the histology. Valvular diseases, we talked about, and the pro questions will probably be related to an infective, infective endocarditis. Just as we've already had people talk about uh, septic emboli to the brain when we talked when you talked about neuropathology, you, there's so many things that can happen in infective endocarditis. You know all the complications, clinical and otherwise, other than the most common organisms. Okay. Now. The rest of cardiovascular pathology, the one area that you often get questions in, is has to do with classic vasculitis, because a lot of these are associated with classical clinical scenarios, and also some autoantibodies, all right, so that they are a favorite place to ask about autoimmune diseases and about clinical uh, multiple system clinical disease. So here, a question, 75-year-old woman complains of periodic severe headaches and presents with sudden loss of vision in her left eye. The pattern of injury in her disease is most likely due to fibrinoid vascular wall necrosis, granulomatous vascular wall inflammation, vascular wall abscesses, or vascular wall infiltrated by eosinophils. So we have sudden loss of vision with severe headaches in a 75-year-old woman, 
All right, what is your answer? This is a toughie. If I gave you the answers, it'd be easy. Or the diseases. 40, oh, very. All right. We'll just leave it like that. Fibrinoid, so granulomatous vascular wall inflammation one, and that was correct. What is this disease? Yes, see? Is that the cadre that, that put it over? Okay. <laughs> All right, this is, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, granulomatous uh, arteritis or temporal arteritis. All right, classic 75-year-old woman, often with polyarthralgias also. Okay, so that's granulomatous inflammation. Okay, the classical clinical scenario. Fibrinoid necrosis is bright red. It's called fibrinoid because it looks like just mushy red stuff, and that's characteristic of polyarteritis nordosa. All right. Now, both Rubens and Robbins, and I'm sure other sources, have nice lists and so forth of all the features of these various vasculitises and how you differentiate between the two of them. All right, vascular wall abscesses can be seen in a lot of things, but are often uh, seen in Berger's disease, okay, which is something we don't see much as much anymore. It used to be young men who smoked a lot. Now it's also young women who smoke a lot, okay. And then vascular wall infiltrated by eosinophils, there are some eosinophilic vasculitises, including Wegener's granulomatosis and some of the others, okay? But this was the classical clinical scenario for that. So it would have been much easier if I would given you the diagnoses. That's not what they're going to do in order to get you. They need you to want to know a second level of information. So vasculitis is, again, the scenarios are very important. And P. anca, perinuclear uh, ANCA or anti-nuclear uh, antibody, or uh, yeah, anti-cytoplasmic uh, antibody is true in, uh, in some forms of vasculitis, and then C. anca is seen in Wegener's. And again, the, I have an addendum that will have you give you some causes. Now here, we have a shifting gears. We're going to a 60-year-old man. This is the better picture a bit. Um, Oh, good. That's good. All right. Uh, with bilat bilateral, apical, partially cavitated lung lesions, also has hemoptysis and a low-grade fever. Very classical clinical scenario. I've given you a special stain, and I can't tell you what it is without giving it away, <laughs> but it's a special stain that lights up certain bugs bright red over here. Oops, that's the histology. And this has been shifted around. Hmm. Okay, A. Asbestos, I don't know why. A, asbestosis. B, fibrocasis, tuberculosis. New and different. C, a good pasture syndrome. D, primary carcinoma of the lung. Okay, and E, sarcoidosis. Okay, so your choices. Um, and I don't know quite how this is going to work when you hit the go ahead and hit it and we'll find out. Oops. Oh, here we go. We'll just assume. Hmm. Let's see. Okay, well, we, I think actually it sounds like your, the APCs worked. Okay, and this is out of order, but that's good. Okay, so, because B is your right answer. This is fibrocaceous tuberculosis. That was a granuloma with necrosis in the center, center a necrotizing granuloma, which means in addition to the fact that that bug you saw were acid-fast bacilli, so that was tuberculosis. 
The closest thing in this list would have been sarcoid. But remember, it wouldn't have had a bug, and it would be a different kind of granuloma. Not, it would look a lot like it, but it wouldn't be necrotic in the center. It would be non-caseating. In other words, it doesn't have central necrosis. Now, and the classic clinical scenario is a little bit different also. That's very helpful. Sarcoidosis is usually in much younger, uh, often Afro-American women in the United States. All right, very common in the South, all right, specifically, um, but in, in, in Afro-American women. So classical clini clinical scenario is a bit different and often presenting with mediastinal lymphadenopathy sometimes without even the lung disease. So clini different clinical scenario entirely for sarcoid in addition to a uh, 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 different histology. Carcinoma of the lung is a solitary nodule rather than bilateral apical diseases. That's very helpful when you're looking at an x-ray and you'll Dr. Jumper will talk much more to you about that. Asbestosis is a bilateral lower lobe fibrosing lung disease. All right, so completely different clinical scenarios. And you can see the crossover now. With you can ask all kinds of clinical questions that bring in the pathology by the back door and then ask any kind of question you want. All right, and good pasture syndrome Anybody remember what good pastures is? It's multi-system, and that's very important. If something affects multi-systems, they'll give you the histories for an abnormal kidneys, abnormal lungs, in this case, bleeding from both sites would be good pasture syndrome. All right, and that's very helpful when, you, when you're putting things together. Is just one organ involved, or is it multiple organs? Now, what's another multi-organ disease that affects the lung that we've already talked about just briefly? Wegener's granulomatosis, lung, kidney, and also upper respiratory, nose often. So all those clinical scenarios are just very classic for that. And that's, sometimes they'll alter a little bit because some of them are so classic they're easy. They want to make it harder, <laughs> okay? All right. Uh, so lung in brief, and Dr. Jumper will do a lot of clinical work, obstructive versus restrictive uh, diseases, obstructive, i.e. airway obstructive, versus restrictive or essentially parenchymal diseases. You need to know, go back to your physiology, pulmonary function tests, arterial blood glasses, acid-base balance. You'll see that everywhere. And respiratory physiology and renal physiology, I found very hard, okay? And when you use it during your clinical years, it will become much easier, all right? As soon as you get and watch somebody on a ventilator or see somebody in dialysis, you'll learn all of this stuff. But all of this will factor into your evaluation of a pulmonary patient. You need to know it and work on it all the time. Radiographic and clinical patterns, all right, will help you a lot with your uh, description, either if they're descriptive or they show you x-rays. Solitary lesions have a wide differential. Multiple lesions may also have wide differential, but when it comes to restrictive lung disease, the fibrosing lung disease, they tend to have a very different pattern, for instance, than like cancer. There are some unique features. In the United States, we have a lot of pneumoconioses, people working in coal mines, uh, people associated with quartz mining or silica, so that there are some unique features about clinical histories related to some of the um, inorganic dust associated with some occupations. Systemic diseases, as we've just mentioned, Wegener's, good pastures, systemic lupus erythematosus can affect the lung or the pleura. Rheumatoid arthritis can also affect the lung. Uh, so there's all kinds of ways to tie the lung in with everything else. There are a bunch of smoking-associated diseases. I'll let do Dr. Jumper talk to you about those. Uh, again, general versus focalized disease. You've talked a lot about pneumonias, both looking, and you'll be able to have a chance at looking at some x-rays, depending on what boards you're taking. All right, tumors, their association, the perineoplastic syndromes, the genetics. All right, this is not anything different that we've talked about in other areas. And again, pulmonary function tests, arterial blood gases, know them. Let's go through a couple cases related to specifically pathology. 
We have a 64-year-old man, 30-year pack, pack year smoker, okay, which gives you right there, it tells you that you have a smoking-related tumor, most likely, all right, although virtually all of them are associated with smoking. With right lung mass and enlarged mediastinal nodes. And here's a picture. Histology and a gross picture. All right. Taking a look at that histology. And I don't know have you, if you've had lung tumors yet. All right. But this is either an adenocarcinoma, primary in the lung, a large cell carcinoma, undifferentiated carcinoma, a metastatic renal cell carcinoma, a small cell carcinoma of the lung, or a squamous cell carcinoma of the lung. So in this case, you really need to know the histology. Only, well, not all of them. You could knock out one from the history. The others, you sort of have to know what the histology looks like. So let's see what you can do. Ah, very good, excellent, excellent, yes, hey, all right. And, and, and that's actually, okay, that's the one they're most apt to show. Everybody argues about whether you can tell a gland, a squamous differentiation, but small cell, very good, you guys, all right. You have to tell your pathology teacher you're doing a good job, okay. And again, the metastatic renal cell was whopped out by the clinical history, it's a smoker. All of the others could be in smoker. Which of that list is the one least associated with smoking, except for the metastasis? Adenocarcinoma. Now, that still is largely associated, but it's the one that's most common in non-smokers. All right. Um, okay, so just recognize those four main tumor types. And it looks like you've got that down pat. They do have some associated oncogenes, but they're not specific, so they probably won't ask you, but they do have perineoplastic syndromes. And what's the one associated with inappropriate ADH and that hyponatremia? Small cell, right. And, what's the, and we've already talked about the fact that hypercalcium is associated with um, uh, uh, squamous cell carcinoma. So that's very helpful. Okay. And this is an adenocarcinoma, making some glands. Very irregular, but it's making some lumina. And it could look like an adeno from anywhere else. So it's an adenocarcinoma, a glandular carcinoma, or malignancy. And this is trying to be squamous. Right. This is not the best picture in the world for that. I wish it swirled a little bit more, trying to be like skin. But lots of cytoplasm. Probably the small cell is the one they'd most likely, they'd, that everybody would agree on. So uh, hopefully if they're going to give you a picture, it would be that. Now, some of the special sites, mediastinum and, retro, and, and retroperitoneum, have similar things. And I'm just going to briefly touch on this because we're way behind. But essentially, in the mediastinum and in the retroperitoneum, you have to worry about tumors that tend to occur in those sites alone, but also things ca that can arise in structures that are, that are nearby. For instance, in the retroperitoneum, the kidneys, the adrenals, the ureters. And how do carcinomas present? Remember, they obstruct something. They press up against something. Okay, you can have huge tumors in your abdomen and not know about it until they obstruct a ureter. So anytime you have a clinical history with an obstruction, okay, with something that's becoming dysfunctional, what, what could be pressing about that? Then you have the tumor site. So anything that can, hit the ret that can occur in those lesions could affect the retroperitoneum and think of what the things in the mediastinum, all right? But in general, in the mediastinum, there are some tumors that occur there without originating either in the lung or in the esophagus. And you'll like this diagram I use every day because we get this all the time. All right. In the anterior mediastinum, we have thymomas. Why they're called thymomas? Because they're made from the thymus. And they're actually, most of them are benign. All right. They occur, oops. They occur here in the anterior mediastinum, i.e., this is front, all right, anterior, posterior, and this is the esophagus and heart, the area. The posterior is mostly neurogenic, okay? 
And the anterior is, uh, lymphomas can occur anywhere in here, but they especially like the anterior. And we have specific tumors, for instance, one of the acute uh, lymphocytic leukemias, all right? Uh, the T cells occur in the mediastinum. So some things, some of the lymphomas like to occur in the mediastinum. What's another one of the lymphoid uh, or hematopoietic malignancies that likes the mediastinum? In young people, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma loves the mediastinum, okay? So this diagram is very helpful. Posterior is usually neurogenic. Middle, forget about that cyst that nobody will ask you about because we never see them. But lymphomas and Hodgkin's disease and then thymomas and some germ cell tumors occur anteriorly. GI, as we whip into another organ system. Okay, rapid question. But you have to know what Barrett's esophagus is associated with an increased incidence of what disease? Adenocarcinoma, gastrointestinal stromal tumor, marginal zone lymphoma, or squamous cell carcinoma. Now this is easy if you know what Barrett esophagus is. If you don't, okay, let's go for it. Oh, look at that. Very good. Hey, all right. So you recognize that it's intestinal metaplasia of the distal esophagus. It's about equal with squamous cell carcinoma as far as incidence of carcinoma in the United States. What is, is that true here? What's the most common esophageal tumor here in Thailand? Is it squamous or adeno? It's still squamous, okay. Now squamous is associated with what? Alcohol and smoking together? Probably an HPV component too. All right. Very good. Okay, and the other P, the squamous cell, remember you have to know Barrett's esophagus is intestinal metaplasia. What does that mean? That instead of squamous epithelium, you have glandular epithelium that's taken over your lower esophagus. And if it goes bad, it's going to go bad as an adenocarcinoma, not as a squamous cell. Okay? The tumor associated with C. mic oncogene mutations and often responsive to tyrosine kinase inhibitor Gleevec, imitinib, is adenocarcinoma, B. gastrointestinal stromal tumor, C. you've heard this list before, marginal zone, or D, squamous cell. Different questions, same list. So let's go. What is your answer? <laughs> oh, good. Ah, OK. Gleevec, all right, this, this is a question that covers molecular biology and, and uh, pharmacology and everything else. Gleevec was originally diagnosed or used uh, against CML, chronic myelogenous leukemia, and is still used against that. But it is also, it turns out that gastrointestinal stromal tumors, aha, uh -huh, B1, okay, in the minority, but you won, all right, have the uh, 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 C-kit, they have the stem cell factor antigen, which is a site for uh, Gleevec use. Now, it does not used often because it's not usually a very aggressive tumor and it costs $25,000 a year to give, okay? But it's specifically a tie to a target on a lesion. You might get a Gleevec uh, question about CML, okay? because it's a very hot topic in molecular biology now. But very good, okay. 
And lastly, tumor of the esophagus most closely associated with cigarette smoking and alcohol consumption. A, same list. Okay. So different scenario, same list. Why don't we go? You, you know this. I practically, I think I gave it to you, as a matter of fact. So everybody's supposed to hit the button. Come on. <laughs> and we're getting toward 5 o'clock, so the giants are getting restless anyway here. Oh, look at that. All right. <laughs> Squamous cell. All right. See what happens when you get hungry. All right. <laughs> what else in the gut? Okay? There's, there's an infinity of things, and obviously we're not going to run out of time. But Barrett's esophagus is all kinds of things, including the risk of cancer. Everything in the stomach now is gastric, uh, helicobacter pylori. It's association not only with ulcers, but with also gastric carcinoma and malt lymphomas. Small intestine, colon, we'll go through that and we'll get down to, let's see, okay. All right. Um, liver. I've skipped some things, obviously. Um, except for to get to back to biochemistry, they may ask you, some of the inherited syndromes, Dubin-Johnson syndrome, for instance, to get you back to biochemistry. That's probably the only reason they would get you there unless they're trying to give you a pediatric question. Bud Chiari, hepatic vein thrombosis, may be associated with several entities, so know, at least know what it is. And then be able to work out the general features of the liver function tests to be able to tell you whether you have an obstructive disease or a hepatocellular disease. And I'm sure you've already done that or will do that. But let's use some alcoholic, uh, alcoholism and liver effects to compare some other diseases. Um, again, Americans are very much overweight in general, so we have a lot of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, uh, metabolic syndrome. Uh, hepatitis A, B, and C are relatively common, C especially. Uh, and you will have heard about all of those uh, in your clinical courses. Primary biliary cirrhosis and some other biliary diseases and hepatocellular carcinoma associations. So let's talk about what the expected liver histology and alcoholic hepatitis would be. Steatosis, this is going to be a question now. So this is, you need to know a little bit about alcoholic hepatitis. So if it's steatosis, which is fatty change, remember? Mallory body, central vein fibrosis. B, extensive granular blue cell staining on Prussian blue stain in, with cirrhosis. Or mucin positive cells with uh, pleomorphic nuclei in multiple nodules in the liver. Or ballooning uh, of cells and apoptosis in lobular hepatocytes with interface necrosis and chronic portal inflammation. Which one of those is expected liver histology and alcoholic hepatitis? Okay. All right. A is correct. <laughs> now these are not steatosis, fatty change, and Mallory bodies are not specific. They're all nonspecific changes. Okay, Mallory bodies are uh, problems with the cytokeratin and ubiquitin. Okay, fatty change is reversible injury in the liver, but this is very characteristic with the central vein fibrosis of liver disease. The Prussian blue, what is Prussian blue stain for? Iron. So if there's lots of iron in the liver, what disease is that? Hemochromatosis, so that's not this one. Mucin positive cells with pleomorphic nuclei, what am I describing? Am I describing liver? No, with lots of nodules, that would be a metastatic carcinoma in the liver because liver doesn't make mucin. Multiple nodules, pleomorphism means it's a malignancy. 
all right? And ballooning apoptosis, this last one, is a viral hepatitis. So the apoptosis might help you to say that that was hepatitis. So this is a hard one, all right? But you did well. This is that classic Mallory's body. Here, this is on a regular H&E stain, and it's just a collection of cytoplasmic uh, filaments and fatty change. And you can't even tell this liver, it's got so much fat in it. Okay. And do compare alcoholic liver disease with others, because it's very common. But the fact that the AL, AST, ALT ratio is greater than 1.5 to 2 uh, in alcohol disease can be very helpful in the clinical situation. It is that you, I think Mallory bodies 